My name is Clancy Immerslund. I'm an alcoholic. I guess when you're in Rome, you should do as the Romans do. Uh, through the grace of God and the power of the Alcoholics Anonymous Fellowship, I've not had a drink, remind sedating, or tranquilizing medication since October the 31st, 1958. <laughs> and if you wish to embark, start a love offering going, that'll be all right with me. You missed my birthday, but Christmas is coming. I'm very glad to be here tonight. I, I must say, if I were told I was going to speak tonight, I did not. It did not stick in my mind. And uh, our Sunday morning speaker called me Tuesday or Wednesday and said, "I see you're going to speak uh, Friday night." And I said, "No, I think it's Saturday night." She says, "No, you're speaking Friday night as well." And and I found out that I was. I uh, I noticed she must have found it out because she made some trumped-up story about having to work today, and she isn't here. Uh, but we're here tonight to talk about, I guess my, I hope I can make it at least to keep you going, but I've really enjoyed Jack's talk tonight. I've heard Jack talk several times, uh, and he really, he, somehow he touched me tonight. He, I laughed as hard as I laughed. I really, most of us felt really up after the meeting, and you can't really get to sleep feeling that way, so... My job is to get you back down. <laughs> but I want to talk to you a little bit about a very, very Im important today thing. Probably never in the history of AA very much has there, have there been, the traditions been more under attack than they are today in many ways in some different places. Uh, we have a, we have a uh, fellow in our location in Los Angeles who does speaking around and he's always been kind of an a kind of a barb under the blanket of AA, in my opinion. And he tells newcomers things like, if you were, if you were sick, you wouldn't go to a medical book written in 1939, would you? You'd have to want more modern things. And we don't, we shouldn't have all these, we shouldn't have all these restrictions in AA and all this anonymity keeps people out because we don't know who the wonderful people are in it. And, uh, but most primarily where the problem comes, and it comes to probably every group in America to one extent or another. And that is, why do you have to be an alcoholic to be an Alcoholics Anonymous? Isn't it all just one big disease? Of course it is. I'll tell you to begin with. Let me tell you where that phrase came from. That was started by a treatment center that only had one van. <laughs> they, uh... Yeah. Hop in the bus. It's all one big disease, Jimmy. Well, I want to take a couple of minutes just because this is serious business because probably AA has never been more threatened than it is right now. In all of the, uh, in all of the history of alcoholism, Grandpa, why don't you go back and take care of him? You're very loving from the podium. You don't seem to do much while you're sitting down there. Shut that goddamn kid up. not been easy for you, Janet. <laughs> but in all the history of Alcoholics Anonymous, there's only, only been two, and most of you know this, they're just for the new people who don't, haven't heard it yet, there have only been two brief periods where there's ever been places for people like you and me to go. Outside of that, you were just doomed to live without any help whatsoever till you died or went mad or they drove you away. And most of us know one of them because we're sitting in a meeting of it in Alcoholics Anonymous. The other one, most of us know about but don't know much about it. And that is a hundred years ago, 1840, in Baltimore, six guys sitting around a bar. One had just gotten out of jail again, and he's telling his friends, they said, you know, that, that lawyer said he knows how I feel, but he doesn't know how I feel. Nobody knows how I feel except you guys. And they all agreed. They all knew each other, each other felt, but they didn't know much about how anybody else felt. And they thought maybe we could help each other not get drunk somehow. And they thought that'd be kind of fun. So they drew up a constitution and they all signed it and had it elected the president and all sorts of these six guys. And everybody laughed at them. You know, the, come on, you can't keep yourself sober. Now you're going to keep each other sober. Are you all going to get drunk together? And what are you going to do? And they somehow got to, and they talked to it. One would feel bad. He'd go talk to his friends and so he wouldn't drink. And then one of them would get, and on and on. 
And they somehow stayed sober. They got a couple more, two or three more guys that joined them. And finally, one guy from Philadelphia was there, and he found out. He went back to Philadelphia and started a little bunch of people, like started a couple of little groups, or one little group. Then there was a guy from Washington, D.C. They got a little group going in Washington. They got a little group going in New York. Got a little group going in Boston, which really took off for some reason. And all over little tiny bunches of Schumann flotsam and jetsam somehow staying sober. Nobody could understand why. At the end of the year, they had a, they had a number of chapters. And they had taken a name. They, they said, no, never in history has there ever been drunkards helping drunkards stay sober. So I guess we're the first of a kind, just like America is the first of a kind. So we, they want to give themselves a name. So they called themselves the Washington, the George Washington Society, because he was the first of, of his type. At the end of two years, they had uh, most of the states, groups in most of the states. Now stop and think how, how difficult that is. No telephones, no cars, no nothing. It had to be just one-to-one. -one it was very difficult to do anything. At the end, they, they had started in March, but they decided to take Washington's birthday as their anniversary date, so close enough, it became kind of significant, February 22nd. So just before the February 19, or 1842, they sent out a uh, letter to all the chapters they could identify and said, you know, a lot of people just don't understand what we're trying to do. Uh, they think we're some kind of crazy people. Why don't you invite someone from your community to come in and speak to our group on our anniversary? And not so much that we're going to hear what they got to say, but they'll see that we're not crazy people. So all over the country on February 22nd, 1842, local people of some degree or notoriety or others came in and talked to the Washingtonians. In Springfield, Illinois, incidentally, a young lawyer who didn't have much success named Abraham Lincoln was the speaker. If you look through a, a book of Lincoln's speeches, you find a speech to the Washingtonian Society, Springfield, Illinois, February 22nd, 1842. I have it on my wall. It's a very interesting talk. He, uh, he was quite, he didn't drink at all. He had no drinking problem, but he was quite perceptive. He said something effective, you know, most of the people I, that I know in here are sensitive and rather intelligent. The only difference between you and me is that I don't have the thirst you seem to have. And I don't know why you have it. And I don't know why I don't have it. But I'm sure if I had it, I would be where you are sitting tonight. And on and on. But all of the, and little by little, it continued to grow. By 1845, they had, at the bottom estimate of their membership, was 100,000 sober drunkards. Now, that may not seem like a hell of a lot to you stop and think after five years, AA, with telephones and cars and transportation and all sorts of things, had a little over a thousand people sober. And they were doing wonderfully well. And uh, they were doing so well that they began to think about some things, and they seemed right because they seem right to members of AA today. If we are able to help drunkards... We should be able to help all sorts of people because we have such a force for good. And so a number of them began working with narcotics addicts who were not drunkards, but just narcotics addicts, not in heroin and cocaine like today, but laudanum and opium, which she used at the time. Many of them got into temperance work where they'd stamp out the sale of alcohol and there would be any more drinking problems. Some of them got into the movements about slavery. Some were, wanted the annexation of Texas and some didn't want it. And, and they all put their forces to good. And they got little by little, they, they went along. Their speakers got, their speakers were having some problems because they developed three or four really spellbinding speakers who traveled around the country and they were getting paid for their efforts and they were doing a wonderful job. But they get, they get arguing over who's, who was getting the most newspaper articles because they were, they felt they weren't getting enough attention from the other members. And there started to be some conflicts. And uh, by 1848, three years later, the Washingtonians, to all intents and purposes, were extinct. And with very few exceptions, they all died drunk on the street. I, I have read a book written in 1862 by one of the surviving members, and he, he just baffled by it. He said, I don't know what happened. We were doing so well, and all of a sudden, people were arguing with each other, and people were fighting, and and so-and-so, the big speaker, got drunk, and this other big speaker got drunk, and, and it was just terrible. We don't know what happened. I'll tell you how extinct they became. Now we jump ahead a 100 years to 1940. 
1941 and 1942. This fledgling thing called Alcoholics Anonymous. And they just had a book written a couple of years before that, published, written in 1938, published in 1939. They have got some steps, and so they've got some pockets of a, they got a group in Akron and a group in New York, which are the basic groups. So they've got a group in Chicago and a group in Los Angeles and a group in Houston and a group in Dallas and a group in a few cities around the country. And as the 1940s went along, little by little, this new thing called Alcoholics Anonymous began to have some severe problems. People were arguing and fighting. People were debating who should get attention. People were having their pictures in the paper. People were discussing all sorts of things. People were having putting their names behind new movements. For example, uh, the National Council on Alcoholism, under a different name, founded then. And, they, and this woman talked Bill and Dr. Bob into putting their names on the letterhead to imply Alcoholics Anonymous was behind it. And on and on and really, and by the mid, by 1944, Al, Bill Wilson, reading the mail, going across his desk, seeing little by little his disintegration. And by that time there were such conflicts. For example, the, the group in Akron had stayed rather close to the Oxford movement with its more, more slightly religious interpretation. And the group in New York had gotten away from the Oxford movement, got away from the four absolutes, and were more into a uh, action-dominated thing. And so there were big conflicts between these two areas. For example, the group, the A's in Chicago, would not correspond with the A's in New York because they said they're just not doing it right. We'll only correspond with Akron. And out in Los Angeles, the people of Los Angeles would not correspond with Akron. We don't hear about Akron. We only need to go to New York. And all over the country, people were fighting and arguing and raising hell. And by the 1944, about Bill Wilson began to notice that A, as to all intents and purposes, had peaked and was going down again. More people were getting drunk than were getting sober. And he couldn't, didn't know what to make of it. He wrote these letters frantically trying to help people, but people were in such bitterness. And some guy in North Carolina wrote him a letter and said, uh, we're going to go the way that we're going, the way the Washingtonians, Bill. And I'll tell you how extinct they had become. Bill Wilson had never heard of the Washingtonians, the only successful treatment of alcoholism in the history of the world. And he got some books and read about it and discovered God, they're very similar to us. They got some of the same problems I see going across my desk, and they had fights amongst themselves, and they and they fought over power and prestige, and they they got so mixed up with so many things. And he he didn't know what to do, but he, in a vain and terribly all-out effort to try to save this thing that he felt so strongly about, he sat down and in mid 1940s wrote the Twelve Traditions. And the 12 traditions, you know, a lot of us just think they're well, there's just something to come out with a book. And they didn't come out with a book. They came out long after, after thousands more of people had died drunk as a result of not having them. And they didn't, they are not some, this is the way it should be if you want to be good. They are based on the, on AA experience. They're also based on the experience of an organization that lost a hundred thousand sober members in three years. And so he wrote them, not the way we read them tonight. He wrote them in the long form, which is the, some of you are not familiar with the long form. It's in the back of the book across from the short form of the traditions, uh, which to me are, they really flesh it out. In our group in Los Angeles, which is a very large group, we read the long form of the traditions one week a month. We read the short form three weeks and the long form one week a, because we want new people to realize what we're dealing with here. But he wrote these 12 traditions and then he introduced them one by one in the grapevine, which is kind of a fledgling new little paper running. And uh, Alcoholics Anonymous in the 1940s was the same way in many ways as Alcoholics Anonymous for all the rest of the time. It has one basic flaw. It is full of alcoholics. <laughs> and I hope it stays that way. But they, a lot of people refuse the 12 traditions. We don't want even rules. We don't want laws. We don't want to fight love, God damn it. You know, so they refused to accept the tradition. So Bill Wilson spent several years traveling around the country, talking to people, trying to get people to believe it. Nah, I don't want to hear that. People in Cleveland didn't want to hear it. People, oh, they didn't want to hear it. Ah, come on, we don't rules. Some people wanted to hear it, and a lot of them didn't. 
And it got to a point, some accepted it, but it got to a point that Bill and Dr. Bob were concerned. Their followers didn't get along, but they got along. And so Bill and Dr. Bob got to said to their followers, why don't we get a get together? It's never been done before, but let's get a whole, all the sober alcoholics that want to come together and we'll have just one big meeting and they'll all understand each other and they'll all see each other and we're not so different after all, we'll be fine. So they told their followers, find us a place to meet and we'll have a big get together. Well, the people in Akron said, we'll, we'll go to a get together, but we won't go to New York. Not with those people. And the people in New York, not to be outdone in spiritual values. <laughs> and we'll go to a meeting. We won't go to Akron with those absolute pukes. So Bill and Dr. Bob had to get together and they came up with a Solomon-like decision. Cleveland. <laughs> okay. So in July of 1950, the first group of sober alcoholics the large group of sober alcoholics ever got together, got together in Cleveland, Ohio. There never had been, although people didn't pay much attention, I don't suppose, but there had never been anything like it in the history of mankind. I have a picture of that convention, and I have the tapes of that convention, and it's fascinating to hear. That's where Dr. Bob gave his last talk, which has been reprinted and talked about many times. Some new people haven't heard of it. But he was dying of cancer. He'd been 15 years sober now, dying of cancer had to help him to the podium and he tried so desperately, he wanted so much to tell these people what he had learned to, so he could share before he died, so he, he could, because he was so, such a believer in AA. And he gave a little talk and he gave three points in his talk, which oddly enough are just as accurate tonight as they were the day he wrote, said them. He said, first of all, let's remember to keep our, let's remember the simplicity of our program. Let's not louse it all up with Freudian complexes which may be of interest to the scientific mind, but has nothing to do with our work here. When boiled down to the last, our work consists of love and service. And we all know what love is, and we all know what service is. And he said, secondly, let us never be too busy or too smug to stop and give the man behind us a pat on the back. Maybe take him to a few meetings, help him out, because none of us would be here if someone hadn't done it for us. And thirdly, he said, let us guard that erring member, the tongue, and try to use it with kindness and understanding. Which doesn't sound like much, except everyone in this room knows that feeling of using the tongue to just lash out. You could just cut your tongue off later after saying such things. And he sat down, and shortly thereafter he died. But among the other things that went on the convention, they had six young guys, and these gave them two traditions, and they got up, and on these tapes, you could hear them, they tried to explain to the membership, these are not rules or laws, these are suggestions that we have to do for our own so we understand where we are, so we're not just dissolving. And they, they had to point out, there is no enforcement. We have no enforcement in our traditions. Some law, you know, no enforcement. Most old-time sponsors think there should be some enforcement. <laughs> and in my, where I live, I'm sometimes known as a dictator-type sponsor. And people say, oh, damn dictator, Nazi group, you know. <laughs> sometimes that's the only way you know you got a good group is when the losers are calling you Nazis. <laughs> uh, but it's hard to explain to people it's impossible to be a dictator-type sponsor without the absolute approval of the dictatee. Because all he ever has to say is, screw you, and the dictatorship is over. <laughs> I've always thought that it would be nice if we did have some AA enforcers, you know, could come at night and say, did you say screw you to your sponsor? <laughs> come with us. You still have relatives in Akron. <laughs> but when they saw that what the traditions were, they accepted them in the long form, and then later they reduced them, abbreviated them for convenience sake to the short form. And uh, from the time they were 
accepted till tonight. There's only been one change, and there's been one minor change, a very understandable one. In the first appearance, the third tradition said the only requirement for membership is an honest desire to stop drinking. And after that was printed, they realized no newcomer ever had an honest desire to stop drinking. <laughs> That's what you get after you've been in AA a while. If you have a desire to stop drinking to get that bitch off my back or something, you know, but... And so they got together and took the word honest out. And that's really true. And so so today we've had these 12 traditions. They've uh, stayed with us over the years. Some places they're drifted into obscurity and almost never even understood. Some places they're never read. Some places, sometimes when they are read, they just give it to the newest newcomer to see if they can pronounce autonomous. Uh, you read it, Jimmy. You were you just one of the treatment center this morning. Well, <laughs> That's all very nice. So we have 12 traditions now. And it's an interesting thing that the 12 traditions are probably more valuable to us than the 12 steps. Which sounds a little odd, isn't it? But if I don't work the steps, which are an individual thing, I might uh, get drunk and I might just live in terrible agony. But if we ever lose these traditions, we might all get drunk. and We might live in terrible agony. Now, you look at those traditions, it's kind of interesting. If you look at them and you stop and think of where AA was when they were written, they're really in the order that they talked about. First one dealt with unity. Unity. Because there were such battles going on. We try to convince the people, get along for Christ's sake, or it's going to be all over. And the second one, there was a great deal of power struggles in the Washingtonians. So Bill had the foresight and insight to... Uh, Say we, uh, you know, the only the only power here is the God working through the group conscience. And he said the only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. We want to do something about that. We want to help people have a desire to stop drinking. And each group is autonomous. We can't run their groups. And our primary purpose is to carry the message to the alcoholics to suffers. Those are the top five items that he could think of. Then after that, there are some other things in dealing with money and property and prestige and finally with anonymity. But those were the top items. And uh, anonymity, oddly enough, anonymity and membership today continue to be a problem that are debated in each generation. We have to reinvent the intellectual wheel every so often because every new person got a new opinion. We are pretty well convinced about anonymity now. I think for a while a few years ago it was kind of tough. There were people breaking their anonymities right and left thinking they were going to help AA. And uh, they said, we don't have to be afraid anymore. We're, we don't have to be anonymous. We're uh, we're going to help AA. Several movie people that I know uh, broke their anonymity. It's an odd thing. And none of them ever did very well after that. And you wonder, why why should you break your, why should not break your anonymity? And the answer is not because you're protecting your Anonymity is not designed to protect you. Anonymity is so that I will not use AA as a vehicle for my own self-aggrandizement. And I will never be in the position of thinking, I am helping AA. Because that's what happens. When you write your book, I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Look how I've helped them. I no longer need AA's help. I'm helping them now because I'm such a big person. I've never seen anyone break their anonymity who didn't have an unhappiness afterward. Lillian Roth was the first one who brought that to my attention. She was a famous singer in the 1950s, and she wrote a book called I'll Cry Tomorrow, in which she, over the opinion, over the advice of her sponsor, wrote, I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, has made it all possible. She said, look, I am helping these people. They'll, when, Lillian, when they know Lillian Roth's an A, they'll want to come. And a couple of years later, when she lay face down drunk in Palm Springs, and her pill bottle in one hand and her whiskey bottle in the other hand, uh, people didn't pay much attention to her at all. Afraid. I remember uh, when I was again new. These were people when I was new. Diana Barrymore, son of, daughter of John Barrymore, and a lot of people that I knew had worked with her and helped her. And she she wrote a book called Too Much Too Soon, and she talks about the wonderful help that she got from Alcoholics Anonymous. Not was her a pleasure to to pay it back and know how much they helped her. And now that she learned about her alcoholism, she could drink wine with meals. That's which part of the thing she'd learned in AA. She said, and when she died drunk, I used people didn't care much about that. But it went on and on and on. There, you know, 
You don't always get drunk, but you get in trouble because you take on something else. Anonymity, the last letter Bill Wilson ever wrote dealt with anonymity. It's a spiritual principle. It isn't to protect my anonymity. It's to make sure that I offer up my ego to Alcoholics Anonymous and keep it that way. Now, that's one end of it. The other thing that's under attack, and this is under attack today and everywhere, Why do you have to be an alcoholic to be an Alcoholics Anonymous? Isn't that just a bit elitist? Isn't that just a bit much? You know, don't other people have a right to be here? They need help as badly as I do? Why don't they have the right to be here? You don't. Get out. <laughs> Sorry, I, I was going to use the velvet glove tonight. There are two things that we want to discuss just briefly. One, the one thing that people always use. Well, let's put it this way. What makes, what, what, why is it necessary to be an alcoholic? Well, quite simply, it's this. Alcoholics Anonymous has nothing relatively new in it at all. There's no information today that isn't found in a lot of places. For people, as Jack talked about tonight, and you will hear again and again in your home group when you, when you talk or when other people talk, what makes Alcoholics Anonymous work? Not the information I'm getting. I've, by the time I was 21 years old, I had enough information to make me stay good for 5,000 years. I, but I always knew they didn't understand. They didn't see. The thing that makes AA work is this. It's the number one thing. Identification. If I can ever believe that that guy knows how I feel, then I can under, I can try using what he says. But otherwise, it's just some guy saying, "Well, I'm a I'm a minister, and you ought to be good and go to church more often." Thanks. What you do? It's not. It's it's information. What makes identification in Alcoholics Anonymous? It is when. I was thinking about this. I've been working with a narcotics addict for over 25 years, but I'm not an addict. But to this day, when I hear an addict talk, which is as rare as possible in an AA meeting, I hope, I don't know, I'm, I'm interested, but it's just information. But I was thinking that's when Jack was talking. Talking about the petty, little nonsensical problems people like he and I, and I presume have, and how drinking makes it better. Not Anything else, drinking, having a few drinks. And just know that it's all right then. And having a feeling of just your whole body starting to feel better and you're something. And I say, yes, I know how that feels. That's why you can laugh at it. Jesus, I know that feeling. And there's getting things so out of whack. We were talking after the meeting tonight. Uh, Marcia and Johnny and I were talking about this, this funny thing, how things get out of proportion, huh? I think I can't quote him exactly because I was, but said, you know, had terrible things happen to me. I was losing my job. My car was smashed. My my shirt was buttoned wrong. You know, and they're all equal equal problems. You know, just. <laughs> and everybody knows that feeling. It is not just a coincidence that the only two successful therapies for the treatment of alcoholism have been the only two treatments where alcoholics worked with other alcoholics. Nothing else has ever worked. Ever. And there's been millions and millions of dollars and millions of man hours put in to help people. There's been one, these two places. But then the argument goes, ah, but listen. The third tradition itself says the only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. I've got a desire to stop drinking. Even though I only had one glass of beer last year, I've got a desire to stop drinking, and you can't keep me out. Pretty unanswerable. Except when you read the long form of the Twelve Traditions from which it was made short. The third forms, third tradition in the long form says... Our membership ought to include all who suffer from alcoholism. Hence, we may refuse none who wish to recover, alcoholics. 
no right money a membership ever depend on and money or conformity. Any two or three alcoholics gathered together for sobriety may call themselves an AA group. When they when they uh, abbreviated these traditions and said the only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking, never in their weirdest dreams did they think that years later people would try to sneak into AA. <laughs> yeah. What do we do if someday they try to sneak in here? Oh, you're crazy, you bastard. You know. <laughs> Alcoholism, must you must be an alcoholic. In fact, there's a pamphlet. It isn't very hard to find. It's uh, Problems Other Than Alcohol. And it's abbreviated. It's written by Bill Wilson. And it, I carry it in my wallet. I wish I had it tonight. I was going to read it, part of it, but I forgot it. But it's upstairs. But it's, it says, very specifically, it's a series of questions and answers. He said, must you be an alcoholic to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous? Yes. Should we, should we allow people to think that they are members of Alcoholics Anonymous even though they are not alcoholics? No. Can people who are alcoholic but have other problems be Alcoholics Anonymous members? Yes. You can be an alcoholic and anything else. You can be an addict. You can... Be a gambler, you can twist baby chickens next. Who cares? You know. <laughs> or like, or like some of our speakers just assassinate him. Is that okay, Dad? <laughs> God, it just made me sick. <laughs> but you have to be an alcoholic. Why? Because we're better than anybody else? No. Or worse, not worse. That is why specifically, in the late 1950s and the early 1960s, in the period of very few years, in Los Angeles, by all of the people that I'm talking about, I know or have known or did, some of them did. Two guys who were narcotics addicts, who are also alcoholics and members of AA, wanted to help narcotics addicts who did not have a drinking problem. And they could not really be part of AA. So they got permission from AA, changed the 12 steps, and formed Narcotics Anonymous for members of narcotics, narcotic addictions who could come and identify. A woman a, and, and her friend, who had a terrible, uh, a couple guys, formed gam or Gamblers Anonymous, a guy named Jim Willis, Sybil Willis Corwin's husband at the time. She is the longest sobriety in the world now, and she's unfortunately in a, in a home because she has Alzheimer's, but she's a great, she's a great woman in her day. But he formed Nar Nar uh, Gamblers Anonymous. And you go to Gamblers Anonymous all over the world and you'll find reverence for Jim Willis. Because by God, he, he saved their lives. You go to Las Vegas, it's like seeing Bill Wilson, you know, Jim W. Jim, like Jim W says. And here's an interesting little thing. I knew Jim very well. He got so involved in his Gamblers Anonymous work, he really didn't have time for much work around AA. He was helping gamblers. So people were all very shocked when he got drunk and died drunk. But they still revere him in Gamblers Anonymous because he never gambled again. But that's what happens to alcoholics sometimes when you're not doing what you're supposed to, not taking certain steps. Not identifying. It isn't that you're doing good things. You're not identifying where you're getting more and more different. But all over the world, there's not, uh, Gamblers Anonymous. In uh, a couple of women I knew, who were Alcoholics Anonymous members, who had food problems. They got together and formed Overeaters Anonymous. All these things happened with just three or four years when I was newly sober. And in fact, there's one of the great examples of what AA is about an identification. When I was about two years sober in 1960, one of these women asked me to come over and talk at their fledgling little OA meeting. And I, uh, I, I was skinny there, right? about 120 pounds or 25 pounds. I didn't have any front teeth. I couldn't eat much anyway. <laughs> but she heard me discuss obsessions at a meeting and thought her membership should hear that. Now, I was an authority on obsessions. Not the recovery from them, just the obsessions. I knew about obsessions. <laughs> and so I went over and spoke at this OA meeting. And the, one of the very first meetings, I mean, the first few months anyway. And I went in this room and there was about six fat women sitting around a table. And, uh, and they looked at me. And I gave them a wonderful talk on obsessions. I thought I wanted to help these people. 
I wanted to help them find what I had found, which is ongoing pain. See, but, but I know I really wanted to help them find something. And I gave a good talk, and I sat down quite happy. I hoped that would help. And then they participated for a little while. They had a little talk. Their little talks. And I couldn't believe my ears. This one woman had eaten had eaten a chicken and a half the day before. And I thought, Jesus, you know. What's wrong with you? <laughs> Some woman had eaten, a, I don't know, almost a gallon of ice cream. Just almost a gallon of ice cream. And I thought, for God's sakes, just a bowl. Take a bowl and say no thanks. Christ's sake. One old fat woman over here said, I just eat so much I can't eat anymore, but so I put my finger down my throat and get it out of my system so I can eat some more. <laughs> oh! <laughs> Don't bother shaking hands with me after the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Why? So I, food didn't do that for me. It did it for them. I now look back and know exactly what it did. I know intellectually, but then it was just information. Just weird information from weird people. <laughs> and I understand why people around me all my life and even to die who are not alcoholics cannot understand why I have a I have a beer or two. Can't you have a beer or two, they tell me? Can't you have a drink or two? How do you explain that to them? Because the identification. Someone has to say, you can't have a drink because it turns you on. It makes that boom go and you're ready to go. Yeah, I understand that. But someone said, oh, you, you shouldn't drink. Or just drink in moderation. Maybe you take some enzymes. <laughs> and little by little, I intellectually know about alcoholics. I mean, I intellectually know about narcotics addicts, cocaine addicts. They formed, some members of AA formed Cocaine Anonymous. Cocaine Anonymous has become quite successful. Narcotics Anonymous never was truly successful. It is in little pockets. but it, And I'm not attacking it at all, but it, I've known several people in NA who've never been able to quite make it. And it seems to me, I think, there's a basic thing there in my, this is only my opinion, my observation, but because narcotics addicts are of that sort are different than alcoholics. Because narcotics addicts, it seems like, heroin especially, they are taking heroin to get out of the world. Just to get out of the world. And that's that's why they die for them. Because they, they have to come back to the world. They eventually take more heroin. Eventually you can't get where you're going. So you take more and more and you overdose. You always die from overdoses. Never from withdrawal. Always from overdoses. But when they are sober, their aim is to get out of the world. People like me, or many people like me, I am myself, I drank to get into the world. And I want to be part of things. I want to be something. Whether I am or not, I think I am. And that's why narcotics addict so often is more necessary to be cool and you don't look good when you're committed and taking actions. Man, I don't want to see all that crap. You know, and they die off. Watch these NA meetings die off. They've been there since the 1950s. And I bet you could count the number of successful large and dynamic NA meetings on two hands that I know of. Because it's a different problem, but that's nothing to do with us. Our problem is this. We have to find a way to maintain Alcoholics Anonymous. I do not find any help to speak of, except as a Ilya Masonary or some uh, giving thing, to go to a meeting and hear people get up and talk about things other than drinking. Now, I don't mean Emotional problems. I'm talking about, and then I ate, and then I gambled, then I took drugs. I really don't care. That's very interesting. It's all information. But I'm there to save my bacon, and I save my bacon by identification. And that's what helps us to stay here. And that's why they, that's why specifically in the fifth tradition, Bill Wilson wrote, our primary purpose is to carry the message to the alcoholic who still suffers. It's an interesting thing. In the long form, of the, the short form of the fifth tradition says, each group has but one primary purpose, to carry its message to the alcoholic who still suffers. In the long form of the traditions, where 
all of the other traditions go to on and on. But the long form of the fifth tradition says, each Alcoholics Anonymous ought to be a spiritual entity having but one primary purpose, that of carrying its message to the alcoholic who still suffers. That's all it is. It's all it's about. We have been given a gift of being able to help people by worming our way into their confidence by establishing identification. Information is all very nice and sometimes it helps people. But identification gets them to believe and take actions. I think that Alcoholics Anonymous is the same thing tonight in Myrtle Beach as it was June 10th, 1935 in, in Akron, Ohio. It is one alcoholic talking to another alcoholic to help him reduce his feelings of difference at least enough so that he will begin to take actions he does not yet believe in. Because if we can't get them to take actions they don't believe in, they're going to die. And that's all AA is about. That's why we say action is the magic word. Not love, not prayer, not spirituality, all very nice things. Action is the magic word. We have to act more than we have belief for sometimes. That's what saves us. And the people who are unable to do that don't survive. So I think that each of us have an obligation, perhaps in our find a way to do it nicely. So we do not let our home groups or our groups drift away from the primary purpose of Alcoholics Anonymous. There are some groups, I go travel around the country, I go to groups sometimes where they let anybody who comes to the meeting participate. Non-alcoholics, al uh, addicts, uh, just passers-by. Really, passers-by drop in and talk. And it makes me just crazy. It doesn't bother my sobriety, but God damn it, the new guy there is going to hear nothing except the same crap has kept him drunk for the rest of his life. And you and I have to have a place. None of us would be here tonight if there hadn't been a place somewhere where we identified and think, my God, they do know how I feel. Without that, there is nothing but information. And I suppose it's kind of corny. Jack was talking tonight about he's a grand, got a grandchild, 22. And I have grandchildren, uh, one almost 30, a bunch of them, most people will or have, or if they don't, you're better off. <laughs> I'll tell you something about grandchildren. I've said this before, but backwaters of South Carolina who have never learned this fact. Down around PD, or what's that? P yeah. Um, my great grandfather was a South Carolinian. Briefly, he he marched right from Georgia up through. Um, the uh, the uh, I started to say something very impressive too. Now. Oh yes, this has nothing to do with our subject tonight, but to something so the meeting won't be a total loss for you. You may have noticed that grandparents and grandchildren always seem to get along very well. Most places, they always get along well. No people never could understand why. I will tell you why. They share a common enemy. <laughs> well. <laughs> so ignore those rotten kids, if you will. But I want my grandchildren if they find it necessary to seek help for a problem of mind and body for which there is no known answer in the world except this, I want them to be able to walk into a room like this somewhere and find it. I don't want them to come in and hear psychobabble. I don't want to hear about your inner child. I don't want to hear about how you were abused as a child. Christ, we were all abused as children. That weren't for that, it would have been boring. I don't want to hear about your addiction problem. My heart goes out to you, but I don't hear about your addiction. I don't hear about your eating. I want to hear how your, your pissy ant little problems magnified and how alcohol made them better and how you almost died from it and somehow AA saved you. And then I think, yeah, I understand that. And I want my grandson to understand that. I want my great-grandson to have a place to go. And we've got to protect the barricades all over the country. Here and there, there are meetings dissolving. And they can't understand. They're going down the way of the Washingtonians. They don't know why. 
in other words, the biggest and most successful group in New York City was the Midtown group. Is that right, Bill? Great meeting. I spoke here several times. And I know the last couple of times they're, they, uh, they're getting too hip and slick for AA. They don't really have much to AA. They announced CA dances and uh, NA dances and NA this and that. And I said, how about talking about AA? And we all know about AA. Leave it up. Just... <laughs> and little by little, they sh- their membership shrunk. And now this largest, most successful group in New York is no more. And all the people who went to it are gone. It's just, they're just gone with the wind. And it's it's something you have to maintain. You know, Bill Wilson, in the reading tonight, the young lady wrote, read very well. I can't remember, I can't quote it exactly, but something like, we have all found a deep spiritual experience and we found a new life. And he wrote that with a flush of enthusiasm of a man three years sober. And it's true, I suppose. It was true to an extent. And in that book, he had a bunch of stories in the back of people just like you have now. And hardly ever anybody realizes most of those people died drunk. Most of the people who had their stories in the first three editions died drunk. Most of the AAs in those days died drunk. Not because AA didn't work, but because they forgot what they were here for. With alcoholics talking to alcoholics. That's they start NA meetings. But they would not do the things anymore. They got caught up in countless vain arguments, which the traditions a tried attempted desperately to resolve. And that's why the traditions are so important for us tonight. And that's why you and I must defend the traditions. When I hear somebody breaking the traditions in the group or going to some meeting where you don't even hear about alcoholism, you hear about all sorts of things, it doesn't bother me. It just makes me a little upset, but it doesn't bother It doesn't make me shake my belief. But when I think about some new guy sitting there or a new girl sitting there hoping against hope there's something here, and hearing the same old drivel she had from her counselor or her therapist and leaves and says, that doesn't work either. Then you think, we're not doing it. So, I noticed the topic of the program says, our primary purpose, under attack throughout the world. And it is. But it's easily defended if you and I will take the time to explain it, to make sure it happens in our group, so that people like you and me will have a place to change our lives. Not only for our generation, for the generations in the future. Our primary purpose is to carry this message to alcoholics who still suffer. Some are sober already, but they are suffering. And only God has granted only one group of people the ability to do that. And that is other people who suffer who have now found a way out. So let's do it. Thank you.